Hello everyone and welcome back. My name is Mr. Cobalt and in this video I'm going to be going over an introduction to gases and their properties. So the first thing I want to talk about is what is known as the kinetic molecular theory, although I'm going to make some changes to it. And I'll talk a little bit about that in a moment. So let's go through some of the postulates for what is the kinetic molecular theory of gases. So the first one is that particles move rapidly and collide constantly. So you for, uh, for a gas, you have a whole bunch of particles. They're very far apart from each other, and they're moving around rapidly, and they're colliding all the time. So that's one. Number two, particles are occupying a negligible part of the total volume. So the gas particles are very tiny, and the container volume is large compared to the volume of those tiny particles. So the volume taken up by the volume of the particles themselves are going to be so much smaller than that of the entire volume taken up by the container that the particles are in. So that's part, that's number two. Number three, little mutual attraction or repulsion is happening between particles. So there is some attraction between particles because of course, of course, uh, particles are always having attractions uh, like Van der Waals forces or London dispersion forces or things like that. But because the particles are pretty much, um, for the most part, very far apart from each other, unless they're colliding with each other, but that's for a brief moment, um, and they're moving very fast, these mutual attractions or repulsions don't really have much time to really affect what's going on in the gas with the particles. <clears throat> so very little mutual, very little mutual attraction or repulsion that's happening between the particles. Four... There are collisions, and the collisions are going to change uh, the directions, changes the direction and velocity of the particles. So the collisions are going to cause changes in direction of the particles, as well as velocity of the particles. And five, collisions are going to be perfectly elastic. What does that mean for a collision to be perfectly elastic? It means when they, things collide, there's no loss of energy during the collision. Right. So normally, if you have a car crash, uh, there is loss of energy due to sound energy being produced, um, loss of energy in the crumpling of the cars or the uh, in the loss of heat. So there's production of heat and things like that. So during the collision, um, there'll be some loss of energy. But in this case, uh, we're assuming that there's perfectly elastic collisions. There's no loss of energy. And finally, the average kinetic energy of the collection of gases uh, or the gas particles depends only on the temperature. So we talk about average kinetic energy because we're talking about the average kinetic, kinetic energy of all the particles in the gas. Each gas particle is going to be moving at different speeds. And so therefore, their individual kinetic energies are going to be different. But if we average those, um, then we get an average of the whole. So that average kinetic energy is going to depend on temperature alone. Increase the temperature, you increase the average kinetic energy of the system, of the collection of gas particles. Lower that temperature, you slow down the particles, and the average kinetic energy is going to go down. So those are the main uh, postulates, if you will, of the kinetic molecular theory. Now, this will apply to all gases, real gases, uh, and also ideal gases. So real gases are the gases that we deal with all the time in nature, uh, all the time. Um, so we talk about real gases, but we also talk about ideal gases. Gases that um, behave under ideal circumstances. So <clears throat> what is the difference between an ideal gas and a real gas? Well, it comes down to basically these two things. For an ideal gas, the particles are assumed to be point masses. What does that mean? A point mass is, a, is, a, is something that has mass, but no volume. It's a point. So a point has no volume. So it's like a geometrical point 
if you've read Euclid or taken geometry, when we talk about a point, a point doesn't have volume, right? So when we talk about a point mass, we're talking about a particle that has mass but no volume. Now, how is that possible? It's not. Um, it's just an assumption that we have. So we are going to have a point mass, uh, something that, a particle that has mass but no volume. So that's assumed uh, for an ideal gas. The other thing is that um, there are no attractive or repulsive forces at all between the particles. Now, for a real gas, uh, real gas particles do take up volume, right? There is a volume to the particle, really. However, an ideal gas will behave like a real gas. I'm sorry. Sorry, flip that. Uh, a real gas will behave like an ideal gas when the volume of the particle is so small compared to the overall container size, container. So the larger the container, the larger the space between particles, then that part, the, the, the volume taken up by the particle itself will be negligible to be as like zero um, compared to the overall uh, volume of the container. So when the, when the volume of the container is large compared to the volume of the particles themselves, then real gases will behave like ideal gases, right? Um, but in reality, a real gas, the particles do have volume. An ideal gas, they don't have volume. Uh, the other thing is there are no attractive and repulsive forces. For a real gas, there really are attractive forces or repulsive forces. So um, in, in a real gas, there's little mutual attractive revol uh, or repulsive forces. But for an ideal gas, this would be no. Zero mutual attraction or repulsion between the particles. But of course, there are in reality attractive and repulsive forces between particles, gas particles. And again, um, when we have a large space, when those gas particles are moving so fast, right, um, then when they collide with each other, those mutual attractions are really not going to affect the speed or uh, velocity of the particles. They're not gonna, they're not gonna uh, collide together and stick, right? So if they stick together, then that would not be elastic. Elastic will have them ricocheting off of each other perfectly, not losing energy. Um, so under normal circumstances, right? Gas particles are moving quite fast. They're very far apart. So you would expect that the attractive forces that they have really are not going to affect anything pretty much. So they're going to behave like ideal gases. So real gases under normal conditions really are going to behave like um, ideal gases. But um, there are going to be certain situations in which they don't, right? So for example, if I squeeze the particles really close together, if I, if I decrease the size of the container so much that the volume of the container is small enough such that the size of the particles, the, the volume taken up the particles is no longer negligible, then no, you're not going to have an ideal gas situation. And so it's not going to behave ideally. Same thing with temperature, right? So if I decrease the temperature and slow down the particles enough so that when they do collide, they're not moving so fast and they're not going to hit so hard that they're going to ricochet. They might stick together. The attractive forces can act on the particles and affect the, the, uh, the I'm sorry, the, um, the ricocheting, the, um, I'm blanking on the word, the velocity, the speed of the particles. And so when the temperature is really low, then that can have an effect. Or if I pump in uh, more gas particles, right? So if I, instead of changing the size of a container, let's say I just pump in a bunch of particles, right? I just keep cramming those particles into the container. Well, then at that point, at some point, the 
amount of particles I have in container are going to be so much that the little individual volumes of the particles are going to take more of the space of the container relative to the total volume available, right? So in that case, your uh, real gas will not behave like an ideal gas. So, so those are some things to keep in mind when you're thinking of ideal gases versus real gases. Okay, so let's now talk about some properties of gases that we're going to get into. Okay, so let's talk about the properties of gases. So the ideal gas model that I was talking about where, of course, you were treating the, um, the particles as point masses, meaning that they have no mass, they have mass, but no volume and the, uh, and, and treating them as if they have no attractive or repulsive forces. That model helps us to predict the relationships between the different properties of the gases. So if we change some properties of a gas and we might be able to, we will be able to predict under these assumptions, what the other property of the gas would be. So what are those properties that we're talking about? So those properties would be these four properties here. So the volume of a gas, which is represent, represented by the capital letter V, the number of particles, which is usually uh, represented by in moles, which is represented by the small letter N, and temperature, which is uh, represented by the letter T and is going to be in Kelvin, always in Kelvin temperature. Uh, and then pressure is represented by the letter P, and that is often in atmospheres, but the SI unit for pressure is kilopascals, or I said, sorry, pascals, but since pascal is a small unit, kilopascals is often used as well. So, uh, so these are the four properties of the gases that have relationships to each other. And then so if we can, uh, if we know some of these properties, we can predict what the other property is going to be. Now, as far as uh, the units go, especially for pressure, let me just uh, restate what the units are because that's imp important. Now, uh, volume of a gas is usually going to be uh, measured in liters. Um, it's also can be measured in meters cubed. So meters cubed is a, is a possibility as well. So it could be meters cubed. Uh, moles is going to be uh, often used uh, for a number of particles. Uh, but for the what we're going to get into later, the ideal gas law, uh, liters is probably going to be the uh, unit that's going to be used for volume. Temperature is always Calvin, so that doesn't change. Uh, as I said, pressure is often going to be in atmospheres. If not in atmospheres, um, uh, kilopascals is often used as well. And again, in the ideal gas law, which I'll cover in another video, uh, uh, it's often either atmospheres or kilopascals uh, for, the, for the pressure. Okay, so remember, uh, since, since the uh, temperature has to be in Kelvin for the relationships between the gases, or the relationships between the properties of the gases, you got to remember this formula, Calvin is equal to the degree Celsius plus 273.15. So if they give you degrees in Celsius, then you're going to have to convert that to Calvin. Okay, now let's talk about force. Uh, well, let's talk about one of the properties of gases. One of the properties is, uh, is pressure. And so we have to understand pressure if we're going to understand how the other properties of the gases relate to pressure. So the first thing we need to understand is pressure. So let's go over pressure a little bit. So pressure, the formula for pressure is the amount of force that's applied to a given area. So in this case, since we have force on top here, of our relationship force over area, if we increase the force, then we increase the pressure, right? Also with area on the bottom, it's gonna have the opposite effect. 
if we increase the area, then that means pressure is going to decrease. So if we apply a given force to a larger area, pressure goes down. If we apply the same force to a smaller area, pressure goes up. So here's an example, or I'll give you a couple of examples. The first example is shoes, right? So if you are dancing, say, let's say you're going ballroom dancing with your significant other, your girlfriend, your boyfriend, your husband, wife, whatever. So, or maybe you're just going to office friends, but you've got two people who are dancing. Let's say you're ballroom dancing. Um, and let's say your partner doesn't dance as well. Um, would you want your partner to step on you with say platform shoes, right? I don't know anyone who dances or does ballroom dancing with platform shoes, but, but bear with me. Or would you want your, your partner to step on your foot with stiletto heels, right? So the woman that you're dancing with, would you want her to step on your foot with platform shoes, those shoes that have like large, they don't really have a heel, it's just large bottom uh, sole or bottom of the shoe, right? Or stiletto heels. Stiletto heels, they have really small diameter uh, heel, right? Which one would apply more pressure? The one with the smaller area. So the weight of your, of your partner is going to be the same regardless of the shoes that she's wearing, right? But if, if the amount of weight or the force, right? Because your weight is, is a, is the amount of, is due to the force of gravity, right? So it's mass and gravity together. So if your partner's weight is the same and if the platform shoes have a larger area, then that weight is going to be dispersed throughout a larger surface area. And so when you get stepped on your foot, it's not going to hurt as much. Probably not at all, depending on how they step on your foot. But if, if your partner, if she's wearing stiletto heels, right, all of that weight, that force, is going to be concentrated into a smaller area. And so a lot more pressure is going to be applied to the foot when she steps on it. Okay. So that's going to be much more painful. I would rather that she step on my foot with platform shoes rather than stiletto heels. Right. So that's the idea. So pressure is going to be related to the amount of force applied to a given area. Larger force means larger pressure. Smaller area on which the force is applied is going to be a, is going to be a larger pressure. Here's another example. Snowshoes, right? If you're walking on snow that is several feet thick, right? Um, you're going to want to wear snowshoes. Why? <clears throat> because if you're wearing regular shoes, your regular shoes have a smaller area, and so your weight is going to apply a pressure to that area onto the snow so that you are going to fall through the snow. You're going to pack the snow below, the, below you, and then you're going to fall in, right? To prevent that, you wear snowshoes. As you may know, snowshoes have a much larger surface area so that your weight is being distributed among a, uh, uh, among a larger surface area so that the amount of pressure being applied on the snow is going to be much less so that it's not going to, you're not going to fall through the snow and get stuck, right? So you want to wear snowshoes when you're walking on um, very thick snow. Why? Because if you aren't, then you're going to fall through. You could fall through to your hip and you'll be stuck. It'd be very hard to get out of the snow at that point. And some critter might come along like a 
bear or a mountain lion, and that would be really bad for you. Okay, so, so that's a, a couple of examples regarding pressure uh, involving force and area. Okay, now how does this apply to gases? Well, gases have a pressure, right? So if we're going to measure the amount of gas pressure, then it's going to be the force due to the particle collisions with the wall. Now, the particles, according to our theory of gases, particles are moving around pretty fast. They're colliding into each other. They're going to be colliding with the surface of the container. So at the instant that the particle is hitting up against the container, it is applying a pressure to the wall of the container. If I take a baseball or a tennis ball and I throw it against the wall, right? The moment it, it, it has contact with the wall, during that time, it is applying a pressure to the wall and then it bounces off. That is called the impulse for those, those of you who are interested. So as it's applying the pressure, right, to the wall, that is a force. So the particles, and we have a whole bunch of these particles in our gas, right, in the container. So all of these particles are bouncing around all the time, right? And any time there's going to be a bunch of particles hitting up against the wall at any one moment, right? All of those particles that are hitting up against the wall are applying a force to the wall. And that container has a surface area to it, right? So there you have the force due to the particles colliding with the wall. All the particles colliding with the wall are applying a force. And the container, the inside walls of the container has an area. There's a surface area to the walls of the container. So the pressure of the gas is going to depend on how much force the particles are applying to the walls at any one moment and the amount of area that, the, that you have uh, in your container, the amount of area the walls have. And that's going to be related to volume, right? So this is going to be related to volume. And force is going to be related to other things like temperature, right? Remember, according to the kinetic molecular theory, the average kinetic energy of the particles is going to be related to temperature. And again, kinetic energy is related to the speed and mass of the particles. So if you raise temperature, that's going to affect speed of the particles. And so that's going to affect kinetic energy. So, um, so this is kind of a sneak peek into the relationships between the various properties of gases, volume, number of particles, temperature, and pressure. So that's it for this video. In my other next videos that I'm going to be posting, I'll be talking about the specific relationships and how they are related to each other and how they were discovered and stuff like that. So stay tuned for other videos. Um, so thanks for watching this video. If you enjoyed this video, if you like this video, if you learned anything from this video, then please like the video, share the video, hit that like button. Also, make sure you subscribe to my channel, hit that notification bell. When you do, make sure you click all so you'll be notified by all the videos I put out. Finally, put a comment down below in the comment section. Let me know what you think. Ask me questions. If you um, want me to cover a topic, if you have a particular question or problem you need help solving, uh, put that down below. I would love to do that for you. Thanks for joining me and have a great day.